I think people thought maybe a couple years ago, they thought, let me stuff a bunch of layers underneath my foot as in like a very padded shoe. We maybe have found out that's not the best idea for a lot of people. Impact forces our vibration. And I want all the listeners to take that away and understand that every time your foot strikes the ground, you are experiencing vibration. What do you think for the individual who has very deconditioned feet um, and that can't necessarily handle just making the big dive to barefoot shoes, how can they transition and make sure they do it in a safe way? Downstep that way and then eventually get to a true zero drop shoe with no cushion, no support whatsoever, no drop, right? So we can do that. But you wanna look at the activity at which people are doing. It appears that for some reason, sometimes somebody's foot will make like an extra bone on the back of the heel. Let me see if I have it on this uh, right foot. I think oh. it's like, I think I might have it a little bit. Maybe you can see. Wow. We have a Hagman's in the room. All right. Dang. Dang. Mark Bell, you've been running enough to get a deformity. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Let's can go. That means you're hardcore. Dude, that's like there getting like another belt. It's you know? yeah, you <laughs> like go. you're in the club. You're promoted. You're in you the club. Yeah. Someone wearing minimal shoes who cannot sufficiently stiffen their foot in the ankle is going to get plantar fasciitis. So my son's going to be two in January. And so I was just wondering, like, how can I make sure that he doesn't run into a lot of these foot problems? Let's talk about walking real quick, because we've talked about walking a lot on the show. What would your suggestion be to people for maybe how they should try to be striking the ground. I would actually call that more of like a pancake foot. What's a pancake foot? Mm, I love delicious. pancakes. I, I, I'm, pancakes are tasty, so we're, on, some we're winning right yeah. here. Some syrup. <laughs> he does have syrup in his like desk right oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah let's cook, oh, let's cook uh, those Butterworths sugar-free. That's mm. the good stuff there. Pancake feet. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, what so are pancake 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 pancakes? Mark's staring at you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's like the cartoons, like when they're uh, starving and yeah. the guy turns into like a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> With the butter on top. Yeah. <laughs> Power Project family, this episode is brought to you by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. Now, we've been wearing Vivos for over a year now, and we've been loving these shoes because unlike your normal lifting shoes, Converse, etc., they have a wide toe box, because we have some wide fat feet, but for everybody, <laughs> you need to be able to spread your feet within your shoes, and then you want them compacted, so they have a wide toe box, they're also thin, and they're also extremely flexible. Unlike most shoes that people wear, they don't move, okay? You're putting your foot into a cast, which isn't good for the strength of your feet. And as athletes and lifters, our force is generated from the ground. So we need shoes that we can express our strength through. And that's why we love Vivo. They also look fucking amazing. They don't look <laughs> like shit, Andrew. No, they don't, <laughs> not at all. These are my absolute favorite shoes. And, um, you know, we could talk and brag about them, but you really just got to get your awesome feet into these amazing shoes. You guys got to head over to vivobarefoot.com slash power project. When you guys go there, you'll see a backstory on why we love these shoes so much. But when you're ready to purchase, make sure you guys use promo code power project 20 to save 20% off links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Do you make different levels of mats? Different like thicknesses? Yeah, different. Uh, yeah, do you, have you messed around with any of that yet? Well, yes. Yeah, so we have a mind body mat, which is softer. Mm. That's for our yoga, Pilates, bar work. We have a training mat that is thinner. And then the standing mat is a version of our pro mat. Mm. Do you do some yoga yourself? Yeah. Pilates, anything like that? Pilates. Nagri. Have you heard of Nagri? No, it's not that, a Lugri. fish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's like sushi. Is oh, that, nigiri. That, yeah, is that what got you sick? <laughs> no, no, actually, let's not talk. About, I'll, I'll tell you guys about that. Yeah, on well, another, another day. Yeah, yeah but uh, no. Sima's trying to cook something. He's trying to, um, He's trying to sous vide his fish <laughs> his in fish. his trunk. <laughs> you know what? People were roasting me on the last podcast we did with um, Jess Pryles because yeah. they're like, oh, Sima doesn't know how to cook. Okay, I can fucking cook, but sometimes He's I take risks. He's trying to strong immune system. Mm -hmm. Sometimes right. I take risks, okay? And <laughs> he likes to live on the edge. Well, when you have a gut like mine, it can handle shit. This is true. Strengthen your gut. That's I all think you sometimes do. too, if the food ferments enough, you can get high off of it. Yeah, yeah. there right? you go. A, a version of high <laughs> could also be sick, but same <laughs> shit. Pretty Pro much, probiotics right? are a thing, right? Yeah. Is that how you do it? I think. Pro, Maybe. pre, yep. pre, post. Sounds good. <laughs> but Legree, you, you know what Legree is? It's like no. I just heard about it yesterday and last week. It's like mm. um, hot. Pilates, oh. but they also go through the movements really fast. Okay, so it's like high intense, high intensity Pilates, like hot workouts. Yeah, that, that sounds like the super reformer, like SLT. They use nah. the the thing I sent you this morning. Yeah, yeah they use the reformer when oh, they're wait, doing. Oh wait, that is the, what it is. 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, I've done a version of that in New York, and these like tall itty bitty models are like doing their thing, and I'm like dying. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no way they're engaging their muscles the way that I am. Like, <laughs> I'm actually isometrically contracting, and I'm like, what? Yeah. It's crazy. It's it intense. gets really hot in this gym. We have like mm. hot powerlifting. <laughs> <laughs> you got to come up with the name for it. Yeah, though. that's what it's called. It's just hot powerlifting. Yeah, it's like a bunch of hot. Fat, sweaty men mm. resting what? too long in between sets. Put some uh, red light or infrared panels around. Oh, yeah. And make it fancy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Biohack it. So you sent us out some of these uh, products from your company, Naboso, and you were you sent me these like weighted sticks and I like asked you, I was like, well, what are those for? You're like, I don't know. You'll see. Like you can just like, they're just like fidget sticks. Mm -hmm. You just kind of like move around with them. And then I didn't know what you're talking about. And then like I'm on the podcast, <laughs> I'm sitting here and I'm like, I think people think I, I'm going to beat them with mm -hmm. these things. They weigh maybe two, three pounds. Two pounds. Like, yeah. I weigh about two pounds. Ooh. And it is fun just to kind of like move around with it just as you're so I'm standing doing the podcast and I can also roll my feet out on it, roll my hands out on it or whatever. So it's kind of neat. What gave you some of these ideas to come up with all these different products that you have? Well, the sensory stick is much more than just a fidget stick. <laughs> That's an expensive <laughs> fidget stick. Um, they all, ma a majority of our products were designed with a neuro rehab concept, meaning that we were trying to access the brain through the skin on the hands or the skin in the bottom of the feet. The reason the sensory stick is so powerful is because of the weight. It's mm -hmm. actually tapping into your proprioceptive system. So holding something weighted actually wakes up the joint receptors, your fascia, so you can connect to the somatosensory system and then stimulate the hand yeah, at the same time. It does feel good to hold it, and, mm -hmm. but it, like I can't put it into those words, but uh, it's definitely doing something because when you grab it, it kind of lights you up and makes you want to kind of move around more. You just yeah. want to rub it in no <laughs> weird way, but like, yeah, seriously, just sitting here like, like while guests are talking, mm -hmm. just going like this. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I've been in many investor meetings where, you know, we're trying to sell them on the product, like, hey, write us a check. And the whole time they're just sitting there like rubbing the insoles. <laughs> <laughs> and then they actually realize what they're doing and we're like, we're totally used to it. Yeah. <laughs> what got you thinking about like, because as we talk about like the mats, the balls, just, just everything, um, what got you into thinking about using all the sensory feedback with all the different products? Yeah. So I actually, I started within the education space, podiatry, functional podiatry, really looking at the foot from a sensory perspective. And that's really where my passion is. I love biomechanics. Mm -hmm. We could talk about supination, pronation, dorsiflexion, the whole mechanical joint coupling. I like that, but it doesn't, it's not where the latest research and advances are within the human body and human performance. It's really what we're doing to affect the nervous system, the brain, the, brain, the timing, the perception. Mm -hmm. So that got me into really studying the foot as this sensory gateway into the brain and into the nervous system. So I started to look at research, surface science, footwear science, really this interface between the foot and the ground and everything in between. And then that's where I started reading about texture, sort of playing around with texture. When we launched our first mat, which was a textured fitness mat, yoga mat, if you want to call it, uh, I totally did not know that we would be influencing movement in the way that we were, meaning people with strokes, spinal cord injuries, feeling their feet mm -hmm. again, high level performance athletes saying that this makes me sense the ground faster. So the the really subtle but powerful effects that we can get on the nervous system, I, I'm even surprised. Mm. <laughs> but now we've we've done some research and we're looking into the power of texture. A way to get like past uh, some of the some of the foot dysfunction that we see, I think people thought maybe a couple of years ago, they thought, let me stuff a bunch of layers underneath my foot as in like a very padded shoe. We maybe have found out that's not the best idea for a lot of people because it appears that that method is maybe making the foot weaker for some people. Oh, 100%. And I think when you look at footwear, running shoes, the changes between minimal shoes, the barefoot running boom to traditional running shoes was really this understanding that Impact forces are vibration, and I want all the listeners to take that away and understand that every time your foot strikes the ground, you are experiencing vibration. Yes, impact, but the way that your brain senses impact is as vibration. So then you have to start to think of that, okay, how do surfaces vibrate? How does cushion and shoes absorb vibration, right? What is that influence that we have? And if we need vibration, 
to stimulate the muscles of our feet, to stimulate a coordinated motor response, to build bone density, to maintain balance, right? You start to look at sensory very different as well as the cushion in the shoes. So traditional cushion shoes is really absorbing all that vibration, absorbing all of your information of how the foot is striking the ground. Mm. So you are moving in what I consider a delayed, disconnected, energy inefficient, really kind of compromised movement pattern when you start to put cushion in shoes. Yeah. You know, the funny thing you mentioned there is it's like, I remember it, it's it's wild because when we started making this transition into barefoot shoes, more barefoot stuff, right? And when I first started, um, when I started going and wearing the old shoes I used to wear, it was weird how it felt to walk with all of that padding because as I got adapted to walking barefoot shoes and the way I was walking was different, the way I was striking the ground was different. When I was putting my shoes in my normal Nikes or whatever, I'm like, wow, I can really pound the ground. And that's not good because when you wear barefoot shoes, you realize you can't be striking the ground as hard as you were. And the way you were striking the ground is not good for the way like force produces up your body. So it's, it's, it's really crazy when you do make the transition, you see all the dysfunction you were having with the old shit you were doing. Yeah, 100%. And I think a lot of people, when they first try barefoot shoes, minimal shoes, and they're like, oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> I get this pain response and I'm gonna yeah. auto-correct, right? That auto-correct being pain is what a lot of people thought the success of minimal shoes was, is that you're just gonna change the way that you move naturally, mm. right? But really what it is, is you are actually getting the full information of the ground, which a lot of it is subtlety and textures, the irregularity of the surface, the vibration, and then you're using that and you realize you don't have to strike as hard. But it's not just a pain stimulus that forces people to change the way that they run or the, the way that they walk in minimal shoes. Do you think there's a safer transition for certain people who have more issues with their feet? Because, you know, one complaint that I've seen is some people are like, oh God, wearing these shoes, just it's too painful for me right now. Or I can't like, you know, they have to transition back into their normal, more padded shoes. What do you think for the individual who has very deconditioned feet um, and that can't necessarily handle just making the big dive to barefoot shoes, how can they transition and make sure they do it in a safe way? Yeah, so shoes are broken down from traditional, let's say, which means they have traditional cushion, maybe some stiffness, maybe a shank going through it. So you can't take a shoe and rotate it or fold it. Very traditional. Has a stack. The stack is the cushion that mm -hmm. is under it. Then you would have actually transitional shoes that would maybe not have a counter, maybe not a shank. So there's a little bit more freedom of movement, less drop, and then less cushion. So that's so good. You can kind of down step that way and then yeah. eventually get to a true zero drop shoe with no cushion, no support whatsoever, no drop, right? So we can do that. But you want to look at the activity at which people are doing, mm. right? To wear barefoot shoes doesn't mean you have to be a runner. I know Mark loves to run. I'm not a runner. <laughs> I tried to get it to run. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> a runner. Happen. I was going to give him a pull-up competition and see who could do more, but hey. I don't run. Mm. Um, so, but to do or to transition into minimal shoes could be you do your lifts, right? So being in a gym environment is where I actually put most of my patients to first go into their minimal shoes. Yeah. Start doing your lifts, start doing your movement prep, start doing, you know, swing the kettlebells in the minimal shoes, right? And start to go there. And then you can go into, you know, maybe some walking, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other key component is that I know there's research that shows that wearing minimal shoes can now strengthen feet. Mm. However, I do not use it as the technique to strengthen feet, mm. right? It's just added benefit to wearing minimal shoes. I want people to start in a foot strengthening program first and to understand the importance of foot recovery. And a lot of that initial foot activation, can you feel your toes? Can you engage your intrinsic muscles? Can you do short foot? Can you feel your feet connect to your pelvic floor? If you can't do that, your feet are not sufficiently strong to withhold the capacity and the demands of minimal shoes. Mm. And that's really what I try to teach patients, clients, athletes, whoever I'm working with, is that strong feet need to be connected to a strong core. If your feet and your core are not connected, it doesn't matter if your feet are strong, it doesn't matter if your core is strong. They've got to be talking to each other to then withstand the stress of 
minimal shoes. Mm -hmm. So I teach that as a technique as or before transitioning Mm -hmm. and then the recovery. And that recovery has to be every single day. As your stress goes up, your recovery has to increase to the same rate. And when you're strengthening the foot, you're able to do so in a controlled environment, right? So you you mentioned like swinging the kettlebells. Like that's a that's a really good place to start. Or maybe um, walking with some weights, a farmer's carry or mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, but you're in a controlled space, a controlled environment. Hopefully you're in like a gym or something where you understand uh, what's on the ground. There's not anything, anything weird in your surroundings. Because what I've learned, especially through running, is that uh, my feet are... Uh, akin to someone's shoulder for like a bench press. Like if my shoulders aren't healthy, I can't bench press. I can't Mm -hmm. train. I can't get the training in that I want to get. And so therefore I can't get the result that I want. If I do something to my feet, I'm screwed. I can't run. And uh, being sidelined for five days or a week or whatever it might be, uh, from from even just a mental standpoint, because I want to move, can be really frustrating. And so you have to do these things in controlled environments and you got to be smart with the terrain that you're on. I don't have any problem throwing shoes on that have appropriate amount of padding in accordance to where I'm going or where I'm running. And also in accordance to where I feel that I'm at at the moment. I dropped weight on my foot um, like years and years ago, like 600 pounds and I smashed my, (laughs) smashed my toes and was lucky, lucky that uh, everything recovered well. But from that time, I've been, you know, kind of uh, skittish, you know, on like with anything touching my feet. So Mm -hmm. my feet became like ultra sensitive because I was like, I'm always going to have shoes on in the gym and things like that. And so it took me a while to, uh, you know, uh, transition out of some of that into some of the stuff that I'm doing now. But I just have learned there's no reason to try to be a tough guy about it. I don't. I don't really care about my feet being tough on a particular run, but over time, I'm hoping that I can strengthen them, make them more durable. And really what I'm after is stronger, just lower leg, Mm -hmm. ankle, uh, foot, uh, shin, calf, that whole complex from the knee down, basically. Yeah, because that's going to affect your running, but also how you lift as well, right? right? And your your day-to-day walking. So it's really the unique thing about the foot and why I think it's, so underappreciated or maybe it's being more and more appreciated Mm -hmm. now because there's more programs and minimal shoes and advocates and podcasts talking about feet but before it was like they're disgusting Mm. (laughs) hide them in the shoe and let's not talk about them and they're also very complex so a lot of medical professionals are like i know nothing about the foot i'm just gonna like Mm. push it over there right but it's, it's really important to then progress in a slow safe kind of gradual way. And the other thing that I do share with people is that when I'm making recommendations of how long it's going to take or what shoes or should you go to a transitional versus just straight to minimal has to do with your foot type, your injury history. So you have an injury history, right? You drop something on your foot. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some joint to some degree was maybe affected. I don't know. And then what are the demands you're going to put the foot under? So if you have a ligament lax, extremely pronated foot, that's going to be very different than a neutral foot transitioning into a minimal shoe, Mm -hmm. right? Or to barefoot training. Uh, History of recurrent plantar fasciitis. Very different transition than someone with no injury history, right? And then someone who wants to do running Mm -hmm. and say, I really want to run a marathon in my Vibrams or in my Vivos or whatever. That's their goal, right? Whatever, that's their goal. That's a different demand Mm -hmm. than someone else saying, I love kettlebells. That's what I'm going to do, mm. right? So you really have to factor in everything, and that's why I can't give really templated answers to everything. Is I really need to understand those three things of every single person. So let's, um, because you, you talked about some detailed type of injuries that can happen there, or de- like detailed factors there, right? But let's kind of bring it up to general things that most people, most individuals who may have some deconditioned feet um, will have to be dealing with as they start recovering. Because like when I started doing this, there are so many little things that were happening to my feet where I was like, oh shit, I can't really put much weight in my big toe right now. I got to wear normal shoes for a little bit. And I had to, I'd get a little, a little niggle. Uh, it would go away. <laughs> and then I'd get a little niggle. And that just means a little tiny annoyance in an area. You can 
<laughs> Look up that definition. Um, and it, it would just happen over and over again. Uh, but, you know, these things, they're just, they're just general things that happen, especially when you make these transitions. So what should people kind of expect to come when they tra- start making that transition? Yeah, so the, these niggles are normal. <laughs> the body Normalize just, it. Normalized, <laughs> yes. The body is just talking to you. And that's what I try to have my patients or whoever I'm teaching understand, that the body is just talking to you. You have to listen to it, right? If I start to feel my right heel as, well, the way that I transition to Vibrams. Mm-hmm. I absolutely loved Vibrams, the, the five fingers, and yeah. I would wear their studio shoe. This is pretty much like nothing, but it would be the shoe that I would love to wear Mm -hmm. in New York City. It was a 15 minute walk to the subway on concrete. And then I might spend my whole day like I would do easily 20,000 steps a day. Right. Wow. So I would start to feel a niggle in my heel and be like, okay, that one, that's what plantar fasciitis, that shit hurts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Where I was like, okay, I feel that it's talking to me. So guess what? Tomorrow... I'm not wearing these shoes again, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go back to something else. I was probably wearing Nike Freight or something. Wore a different shoe with a little bit more cushion. Skipped 72 hours is what I generally tell people is you you have to give this 72-hour window for that. You guys know DOMS, right? Mm -hmm. So just think that delayed onset muscle soreness and that acute inflammatory cycle, you need to allow that to show face, right? So if you kick your foot's ass, day one, you have to wait at least 24 hours for it to show face because it might not show face until 36 hours, 48 hours. But if you've compounded it Mm -hmm. and you kicked its ass again the next day, now you you might not know that it was starting to talk to you. So I try to have this gradual stress recovery, stress recovery, stress recovery. And if you feel this niggle, you have to- What'd you say? A niggle. (laughs) I'm joking, I'm joking. You have to release, take a little step back, understand that that is ultimately strengthening the body, Mm -hmm. right? Controlled stress strengthens the body and that includes the feet as well. And I remember Vibram when they first came out, they got such bad press, Mm -hmm. like all the time. Every week the New York Times was doing another article about how bad these shoes were. Like, oh my God, they increase, you know, bone, bone marrow edema which is just inflammation in bone because you're starting to stress it. Mm -hmm. But if you increase bone marrow edema, back the fuck off, allow it to strengthen and respond to that stress, it will become stronger. Yeah. It's just so funny you mentioned this because I I see quite a bit of comments, especially as we've been starting to do this. There are people who, let's say they started going down the barefoot route, but they didn't give themselves the time every time a little niggle would happen. They didn't give themselves the time to recover. So they just kept going on it. And they're like, it made me have all this knee pain and back pain. And I had to get out of it. This is the worst thing. It's like, you probably didn't do the recovery you needed to do. And Mm -hmm. the thing is, it's like when I first started, I was making those same mistakes. I was trying to barrel through it, just thinking like, I'll adapt, Mm -hmm. right? But then I was like, okay, I I have to back off. I have to let my foot recover. It recovers, it gets stronger, I can do more. And that's how it has to be handled. Yeah, I think that no pain, no gain. I don't know if that's pushed still. I don't know. It is Maybe. still. In, in, mm-hmm. Yeah. In to certain, some degree. Yeah, you know? to some degree it is. Maybe I'm just old that I'm like, no, we don't do that. No <laughs> yeah. pain, no gain anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, know, like, you have to listen to the body, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that that's an important part. And once you get your first injury, right, and you keep pushing it past that point, like let's say you don't listen to – you know, a part of the foot that's starting to talk to you and you just compound it, right? Yeah. No pain, no gain. You push through it, your body will adapt. And then you get an actual, you, you kind of cross this threshold and would have like a diagnosable, I don't know, plantar fasciitis, just make some itis, mm-hmm. right? It is very hard to then not ever experience that again because you have this then kind of injury history or tissue stress that has passed its threshold, which can become a monkey wrench Mm. coming into the rest of your body. And I'm, I'm sure the listeners can 100% relate to this because I tweaked my knee before, right? It just something wasn't exactly the same. I tore this ligament in my shoulder, right? Mm. Something not exactly the same. And it's like it floats around your body. And you're like, if it's not this, it's this. If it's not that, it's my hip, it's my knee, it's my foot, it's my, right? And it just literally moves around. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it ping pongs around <laughs> yes. your body, yeah. 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 Right? And it's just like, really, you should have from the beginning 
just not let that first thing open Pandora's box because then it's it's really hard to get it under control. Yes. Why does sometimes uh, you mentioned like like a bone, like edema? Like I find the bones of the body to be really interesting. It, it appears that for some reason sometimes somebody's foot will make like an extra bone on the back of the heel uh, when they run a lot or jump a lot or have activity that has inflamed that area. What is that? So I think that you may be, maybe our Google. It looks Google, like an extra, <laughs> it looks like an extra bone. Like it looks like your body's trying to grow something out of the, out of the right. back of the ankle. So there's something that's called a Haglund's deformity. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. I don't know if there's like a way to like, mm -hmm pull a mm -hmm. picture up of a Haglund's yeah. deformity. Oh, yeah. But a Haglund's deformity is actually not in response to stress. It's something that is unique to your own structure. And it's it just it sits behind the heel, calcaneus. It's in very unique foot types. There we go. Beautiful. That's a Haglund's deformity. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, something to that effect. I see it a lot in some of my friends that run and uh it it appears to be like from what I've seen um, appears Ooh, to be like an irritant uh, Whoa. that, you know, it appears to be something that was irritated. Like they weren't really necessarily born with it, but maybe they did have so, this uh, deformity right the whole time. That's Whoa. that's a great example. Okay. So what that is, so a Haglund's deformity is a bump on the heel that is just part of your anatomy. Mm. However, there is a bursa, which is a fluid filled um. sac that sits on top of it. And when that gets irritated, bursas swell. Right? Mm. So that will look larger because of what's called retrocalcaneal bursitis, which is going on top of this Haglund's deformity. Mm -hmm. So that's where you'll see some of the recommendations is, you know, don't wear a stiff counter, uh, wear like a heel lift. Uh, you will actually wear a hole in the back of your shoes. So if the listeners are like, I think I might have that, I don't know, yeah. then they can look at their shoe. And if they're wearing a hole on the back of the inside of the shoe, <laughs> I never put a Haglund's deformity in a stiff counter. Mm. So if you're looking at your shoes and you can't squeeze the back of the shoe, that stiff counter is going to irritate that. Mm. Now, what they could also have, which is different than this, is just spurs within the Achilles tendon. Yeah, I believe that's probably that's more very different. accurate of what, it might, what I might be talking about. Yeah. Kel Kelly Sturette pointed this out at some seminars years ago. He'd have some people come up and um, he would show people the foot and he's like, look, like this guy's foot decided to like grow another bone, you mm -hmm. know, because of uh, the stress or whatever it was going under. Yeah, so Wolf's Law, it's essentially just Wolf's Law of, you know, if I pull on bone, the bone responds by putting more bone down, right? So a Achilles tendon spurring mm -hmm. is usually because of tension, right? And it's, I actually see more of the Haglins mm -hmm. than the Achilles spurs. Mm. And then very similar plantar- Probably hard to tell the difference unless you're- Yeah, yeah you do an x-ray mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. then be able to yeah. see. Um, and then plantar fascia spurs, where people say, I have heel spur syndrome which means nothing. Let me see if I have it on this uh, right foot. I think oh. it's like, I think I might have it a little bit. Maybe you can see. <laughs> I'll come over here into the light. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening on audio, the left heel, he's tiny little giving her a good old calf raise until he's, she's checking it out. Touchy Philly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he has a Haglund's deformity. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We have a Haglund's in the room. All right. Dang. Mark Bell, you've been running enough to get a deformity. There you go. Yeah. Let's fucking go. That means you're hardcore. Dude, that's like getting go. like another belt. It's you know? yeah, you like go. you're in the club. You're in you the club. Got a promotion. Yeah. There well, you go. the fun thing is they call this a pump bump, oh. which means that maybe you're wearing a little bit too many high heels. Oh, yeah. I wear high heels all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Well, that don't, sums it up. don't the, the ultras that you wear, are they kind of. Do they, they raise your heel quite a no, bit? They're no, they're all... There should be zero drop. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, they might not look that way, but mm -hmm. they are supposed yeah. to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah okay. so you would eat, you're a little bit more susceptible for Achilles tendonitis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if your shoe has a counter, I would just avoid it. I would mm -hmm. avoid a counter. I don't, I'm sure you don't What's wear a shoe with a counter. Counter. Um, I don't know if you have a shoe in the house, a normal shoe in the house, a sneaker shoe. in the house. Uh, well, I got my Vivos, but... Oh, well, that, that'll actually work. Okay. Please don't throw it at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not ready for catching right now. <laughs> like, like get hit on the face on the show. Okay. Yeah, so here. Oh, okay. Yeah? So if you were... And that's a soft counter. This is a soft counter, right? Okay. So if, if you have a stiff counter, you would take the shoe like this and mm. you would try to squeeze and it would be stiff. Mm. 
-hmm. right? They're usually made of cardboard or plastic, yeah. right? Do you want your shoe back? Oh, you can hang it out up there. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it smells bad, then you can just throw it. Sorry. <laughs> like, no worries. <laughs> We've mentioned plantar well, we've mentioned plantar fasciitis on the podcast quite a bit now, um, and in our Discord group, a lot of people that have been starting to wear vivos or moving more, they have been talking about getting plantar fasciitis. It seems to be something that a lot of people start to get. So, what exactly is going on with it, and can it be just easily fixed? So, two common causes. First, it has to do a little bit with the foot type, mm. right? Because I, I, every single condition that walks into my room or that we talk about, yeah. we have to just factor in foot type, mm -hmm. okay? And then the second is understanding impact is vibration. So I actually consider plantar fasciitis as a vibration injury, okay? So okay. every time we walk, we run, I don't care if you're on your midfoot, your heel, doesn't matter how you're running, right? But you're striking the ground, you're experiencing these vibrations. Now, if bone vibrates, you get shin splints mm -hmm. and you get stress fractures. Yeah, okay? I got a few stress fractures. <laughs> if tissue vibrates, you get plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, you can get IT band issues, you can get calcaneal per periostitis. So you get these soft tissue injuries. Mm. Now, the way that you damp or absorb vibration as the foot is pounding the pavement is you have to stiffen your muscles. And the way that you stiffen your muscles is through isometric contractions. So short foot, I'm sure you guys have heard of short foot, mm. which is pushing the toes down into the floor. When you push your toes down, the intrinsics of the foot contract, yeah. they stiffen, they actually increase what's called compartment pressure. I don't wanna make that confusing, but all of your muscles have to have a certain pressure around them, kind of like a splint. Mm -hmm. So as the foot strikes, it is sufficiently stiff that the tissue and the bone cannot vibrate. You actually just absorb the vibration as potential energy for you to be this recoiling badass that you want to be, right? Yeah. So when you look at, just as a, as a small aside, like sprinters, what makes sprinters fast when you look at kind of the the neuromuscular aspect of it is it's based off of how quickly they can get off of the ground. And there's a direct correlation to contact time and foot and ankle stiffness. Hmm. Foot and ankle stiffness is a myofascial response that is fed through isometric contractions. And this is really what I teach. And as part of my whole foot to core thing is you have to be able to very rapidly anticipatorily, which means before you even, your foot even strikes the ground, contract and stiffen the foot and the lower leg complex so that the vibration is essentially potentiated. And that and that's really what it is with running. And I'm totally going on a side tangent, so I apologize. Okay. But with, with, with running, when you think about heel strike, <laughs> midfoot strike, forefoot strike, the biggest difference between a heel strike, midfoot, forefoot is contact time. Right? So of the three, the one that can get off of the ground the fastest, shortest contact time, just based off of myofascial physics, is a forefoot strike, which is what sprinters do, right? If a sprinter was doing a heel strike pattern, there's no way that they could run fast, right? You just, you can't, okay? So understanding that, that contact time, how quickly can you stiffen, things like that. I had um, a mom of a, a high school athlete messaged me and she's like, my son like is so good. He loves running. He's a sprinter. And he's like first out of the blocks. And then he's like, and then all of a sudden everyone passes him. And he like, he just can't win that 200 meter dash is what, what he was doing. And I was like, send me a video. Like, I don't know. And so she sends it to me and he's like, he is, he's first out first hundred meters. He's awesome. Last hundred meters. He's like losing steam. Yeah. I really zone into the way that he's contacting the ground he was doing a heel strike. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. During a sprint? <laughs> it was a sprint. High school. Remember, High it's school. like the, okay. the well, in football the beginning, coach is yeah. the yeah. sprinting yeah. coach. Well, in right? the beginning of the sprint, he probably wasn't because the, the start, right. you kind of almost got tired. like, it's almost yeah. impossible. Yep. To, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, but he was starting to change and I was like, well, that's why he can't mm -hmm. win if the second half of that 200 meters, yeah. he's doing a heel strike. Mm -hmm. Right. So that goes back to contact time right? Contact time, quick, get off of the ground. This is with anyone. This is professional athletes. This is if you're doing box jumps, if you're trying to be quick with your foot, yeah. your foot has to be stiff and isometrically contracted. 
if your foot is insufficiently stiff, those vibrations come in, they start to stress the bone and the soft tissue. So someone wearing minimal shoes who cannot sufficiently stiffen their foot and the ankle is going to get plantar fasciitis or is going to be susceptible to it. A flat foot, which means nothing. Yeah, <laughs> so I was going to ask you about like, that. We can That's... totally unpack that if you want. Yes, please. But say. a... a Flatter foot, we'll just leave it there right now, and then you can unpack it or guide me on how you want to unpack that, um, is typically slower. Mm. It's just the time to stabilization of a overpronated or a flat foot is going to be slower. So it's going to take them a while to stiffen the foot as they're contacting the ground. So it's like they strike the ground, feel the vibration, the muscles are like, oh, shit, right? They're trying to, like, stiffen, and they don't have enough time. Mm. Okay. So... Now with the plantar fasciitis specifically, um, what can people do to get get rid of it over time? Are there tools? Are there things that they can do on the bottom of their feet? What can they do? This is most of the patients I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there are four things. Okay. And I feel like I've just had this like huge flurry of patients. So I've just been saying the same thing uh-huh. over and over. Yeah, why is this such um, a thing right now, do you think? Like I don't know. plantar I mean, fasciitis, I don't think I've ever heard of it well, before. Honestly, most of the patients Maybe that I years ago? most of the uh-huh. patients that I see are saying, "Okay, I'm I believe in this barefoot lifestyle, this yeah. minimal. Mm. I want to do it. I've had all these pains." So they like drink the Kool Aid, yeah, right, and they're going down that route, and then they start to get hurt, and they don't mm. know. So they're they're a little like kind of floundering. Mm-hmm. So there's four things that you need to do. First one is you have to give the tissue a timeout, and this is where I just like I tell people, just hear me out. I don't know your foot type again. Maybe, maybe for a short period, I'm going to put you in art supports, right? And like, if some people are like, okay, I'm not going to listen to anything else that she says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> but we need a timeout, mm-hmm. right? Maybe it's a little cushion. Maybe it's a little stiffer shoe. Maybe it's a heel toe drop, whatever it is. And I'm talking like two weeks initially, yeah, yeah. right? You need to give the tissue a timeout. Second is you have to take away the stressors. You have to stop running. Okay. So if you're running, if you're doing ballistics, if you're jumping rope, whatever it is you're doing, you have to stop doing that. And this is again for the first two weeks that I tell tell patients. And then third is we want to do very targeted soft tissue release work that you're doing to the bottom of the foot and to the soleus and you're going around the tissue. So the, kind of the foot and ankle structures, but not exactly where it's painful. So we're doing that. And then fourth, again, people have different kind of responses to it, but you have to do something for inflammation. Right. Mm -hmm. Some people don't believe in ice. There's books about how ice is ineffective. But right. So I will tell patient red light if you don't want to. Right. Go do red light. Do ice. Some people don't believe. Do cold plunge. Right. (laughs) Take an NSAID like (laughs) CBD. Like, I don't know. I actually give a long list to patients and I will say, listen, it's your body, your belief system. You could do systemic enzymes, which I love. Red light therapy, whole body cryo, ice it. NSAIDs, topical, CBD, I don't know, eat a bunch of pineapple. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Do whatever you want. But you, have to do down. <laughs> but you have to do these four things, mm-hmm. right? And be really consistent every single day for two weeks. And then I'm going to assess you. That's, that's really what they have to do. Okay. We're putting out the fire. Good. What, um, <clears throat> what, are, what are some things people can do to kind of uh, avoid the, Achille- the Achilles tendon flaring up. I know some people have some issues with that as well. I mean, it's very similar. Yeah. Right. Uh, One thing that I speak about with the Achilles tendon is that everyone needs to understand their own reason for limited ankle mobility. Right. So is it you have a structurally short Achilles tendon? Could be. I've actually worked with many individuals, trainers who were, you know, former high-level sprinters, and they had a structurally short Achilles tendon, and were like, no, nope, it's my goal. I'm going to get good ankle dorsiflexion. I'm going to do all the stuff that I see everyone doing. And I assess them, and they, one, walk with an early heel lift. So they're walking like this, right? If, you, if you're walking with an early heel lift— What, what does that look like, by the way? So when you say walking with an early heel lift, I'm just curious because you can I walk this way? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. okay. it's because it's short. They're okay. bouncing. So they'll walk like this. So they'll strike their heel like normal. Uh huh. Come down, and then as this leg is swinging through, they're lifting their body up already, and then they come like this. 
Hmm. That's weird. Yeah. Interesting. So it's, it's, it's anyone that you you can see their gait, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bouncy like gait. galloping. Yeah, if anyone is bouncy in their gait, yeah. they've got an early heel lift. If someone has an early Short heel King, lift, stand up. they have a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? What? Okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> they have a structurally short Achilles tendon. So I will tell them, like, you can stretch your calves until you turn purple. Yeah. That's just not increasing. Right. So you have to understand that. Is that what it is? And then some people have a actually hypertonic muscle, which means it's like on the edge of spastic. Mm. Does that makes sense. So those would be athletes or individuals that I would say use a vibration based roller. Right. Because some people mm. might be like, well, is a vibration roller better or just a traditional roller or the percussive gun? Like, really, what's better? Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of options now in that space. Yeah. So those would be ones that I would say to do a vibration based roller for those. Okay. And then others, you know, on, could be on, like on the calf in the bottom of the foot? On the calf. On the calf. On the calf. Vibration yeah. based roller. Okay. Yeah. okay. Right. So then they would do the vibration and actually releases the muscles a little bit better and then do mobility work. If you have a structurally short Achilles tendon, you know, here, mm -hmm. <laughs> SOL, I don't know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, and then is it just the soleus? Higher arches typically have tighter soleus. Flatter feet typically have tighter gastroc. Mm. Again, not always, but you can see those associations. So I try to do really targeted muscles. And then really it's just a matter of, you know, do they have the rubber band effect in the tissue? So some of the Achilles tendonitis that you were asking about could be that they've lost the recoil effect of the Achilles tendon. And if anyone is like, I don't know, bored and wants to research the Achilles mm -hmm. tendon, kind of the aspect of it, yeah. is look at research around kangaroos. That's where most of this Achilles tendon, like, you know, what is so fascinating about the human Achilles tendon is they'll make analogies to the kangaroo. And it's like, how does the kangaroo jump so far on these like feet, right? And the power is the Achilles tendon that they have. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Uh, yeah, sir. Um, so my son's going to be two in January. And so I was just wondering, like, how can I make sure that he doesn't run into a lot of these foot problems? You know, like I'm keeping him barefoot as long as I can, but it's been really, really hot. So I got him some minimalist shoes mm -hmm. and they're just like water shoes. And so like, we'll put him in those just when we go outside. But like outside of that, is there anything I can be doing to, you know, just make sure he has a good shot at this? Yes, keep the kids barefoot as long as possible. Um, any of the Naboso stuff, like let him play on the standing mat. My oh, daughter's yeah. now three, and mm. she was on Naboso from the moment she was born. Mm. Like we actually did her whole tummy time on it and had her around the texture. Didn't do shoes until she was a year and a half old because mm -hmm. we had to. Um, so it's just keeping that mobility, allowing them to stay as minimal as possible. But yeah, the the peak window of neuroplasticity for children is age four. So you just need to like dump all that sensory onto children until the age of four. Okay. Yeah. Damn. The, the, you mentioned earlier the pelvic floor being attached nice. to the feet. Mm -hmm. um, that's really interesting. I, I remember you talking about that on the phone. And I know like for myself, one of my things with running at the moment, um, I don't really mess with sprints too often, although I have been incorporating some. Um, and I also don't even bother to try to go 100% just yet because I don't feel like I'm all that prepared for that. So I got to work my way into it a little bit more. But my foot doesn't want to travel back behind my body very much uh, because it just doesn't feel safe. So what have you kind of recognized in having the feet connected to the pelvic floor and the feet connected to the core? That most people's feet are not connected to the core. How can they <laughs> tell? Like um so most of the issues that I find in patients, plantar fasciitis, Achilles, whatever we spoke about already, mm -hmm. I start to ask them about the pelvis, pelvis function. I watch them walk. They either have restricted pelvic T-spine mobility, which completely changes the way that we walk. And that could be like a whole nother 30 minutes that we talk about. Yeah. But if they have SI joint stress, if they have low back pain, if they have groin pain. So I, I've actually had uh, athletic pubelgia. So I've taken a really deep dive into understanding the anterior pubic joint and all of the anatomy and the stabilizers of the pelvis 
for, especially with athletics and how that kind of starts to unravel. Um, they could have a hip labrum tear. So it's really partially based off of other symptoms that they experience and then being able to test some of that strength. Um, but the way that I teach foot to core is really based around a tensioning and I use the breath as the driver to that connection, which means that every time your toes push down, what happens or what should happen is that when you push your toes down into the floor, which is called short foot or doming, right? Foot activation, call what you want. Toes mm -hmm. are into the floor. Your arch should lift and you should be able to see that, right? So yeah. toes down, okay, my arch is lifting. As I do that, I actually teach people every time the toes go down, I need you to lift your pelvic floor. And when I teach the pelvic floor, I teach it in a way that people can differentiate the anterior and the posterior. Because interestingly, it's actually your posterior pelvic floor that connects to your feet. Okay. Feeling Do you things. want? Yeah, yeah, I'm just. You're, just you're uh, feeling things? Okay, okay, like, okay. Uh, I'm trying to. Okay. So yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the posterior pelvic floor is your levator ani. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you need to, every time you push your toes down, you want to. Imagine stopping your poo. Yeah, I want to squeeze that booty hole. <laughs> right? <laughs> but but yeah. so now, but you want to make sure it's not your glutes. Yeah, yeah, not right? your glutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, not yeah. your glutes. Uh -huh. Not your glutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so don't, don't flex your glutes yeah, when you do no, this, guys. You're not you're not doing the Hank Hill pinching a <laughs> yeah. penny. No, 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 no. Yeah. So don't <laughs> don't squeeze the <laughs> butt. Hank Hill from King of Hill? <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Squeezing That's the butt, it. not squeezing the butt. Not squeeze the butt. <laughs> Lift the pelvic floor. Yeah. Right? Stop your poo, whatever. Sometimes you have to shut your eyes to be able to feel this a little bit more. And then you want to exhale. Okay? So you would, when I take people through it, they would inhale diaphragmatically. So they feel the belly rise. And then as the belly is starting to fall, because you're exhaling. So I want you exhaling the entire time. Exhale, so, but not out of your butt. You don't. <laughs> This is serious. I know you're. Here. Good at this. I know you're very good at this. <laughs> I'm sitting over here practicing. Oh my gosh! Okay, that's what that smell was. Mm -hmm. I had to All clean right. up your phoenix just because I knew you used it the wrong way. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> is there a different way to use it? <laughs> but okay. We need a regroup. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. And we're back. And we're back. Okay. Let's inhale again. Okay. Inhale. There you go. Right. So mm. inhale. Okay. And then as you exhale, you want to start to push your toes down. And I want people exhaling the entire time. So for like 10 seconds, you're exhaling. And then as you continue to exhale, start to lift your posture pelvic floor. Right. So you should feel this connection of my toes are down. Mm. My pelvic floor is lifting. I feel this kind of increase in distance between my feet and my pelvic floor. And my breath is leading that entire way, mm -hmm. right? And then you would inhale again and then exhale, keep exhaling, start to lift the pelvic floor, toes down, really focus on the posture pelvic floor, and then release. And you essentially would wave through this about five to eight times. Now, the other way that you can also do it is I call it toe to tongue. So you can get your tongue part of it. And the tongue is a really important part of your fascial system that if you bring your tongue to your palate at the same time as pushing your toes down, mm -hmm. you actually further activate this foot core. It's your deep front fascial line is what we're activating. So I would want toes down, pelvic floor up, but don't forget that it's your levator, ain't I? And then bring your tongue to your palate. Mm -hmm. And then you should feel like you're stacked. Mm -hmm. Right? And then I bring this into the hand. So this is where the sticks the theoretically could come in, is that if you're holding something, I would, would have you, you guys can just hold the one. Mm -hmm. If you have two sticks, you could hold two of the sticks, that I would want you to push your toes down, lift your levator ani, tongue to palate, and then you're just gonna squeeze the stick in your hands, right? And you are potentiating mm -hmm. And then you would kind of relax through it and then wave through it again. And I do this as movement prep. It seems, you know, kind of crazy or just like, wait, what? Like this, this subtle little thing is going to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. But we have people that do this literally in the middle of a triathlon. <laughs> and they're coming off the bike and they're going to do a few of this little potentiation. And then they put on their running shoes and they start running. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I remember the first time that some of the triathlon coaches would tell me and they would say, okay, my, my uh, athlete would be, you know, doing this thing and everyone's like, boom, passing and passing. They're like, coach, what the F am I doing? Like, they're like, trust me, we're just doing a couple minutes, right? And then they put it on and then go pass all those people and then would break their personal record. 
Mm. And it, it just has to do with the nervous system. I call it turning on light switches. I don't know if it's like the New Yorker in me that I was like, get efficient yeah. and like check as many boxes as you can. And like, I don't know, like I'm, I'm all about movement prep. Mm -hmm. To me, that first 15 minutes is like the most important part of a training session. If someone can envision like, I think a baseball pitcher is always a good uh, good reference point or anybody that watched the U.S. Open watching tennis. And the way that people are able to kind of whip their hand back behind their body, especially in the case of a pitcher, um, their wrist goes way back behind their elbow. Their wrist is way back behind their shoulder. Their arm is contorted in this weird, crazy motion. Their arm is up really high. Their body is twisted and if you think about like how much core is is uh, has to be synced up mm -hmm. for that person to be able to throw the ball, and when the core is not synced up, where does the pain go to? It goes to the elbow, mm -hmm. it goes to the shoulder, and so what you're mentioning uh, with with something like running, it is really important. If you look at the best runners, their feet go flying way back behind their body as they're mm -hmm. propelling themselves forward. Maybe a little bit similar to the way a pitcher's arm or a tennis player's arm is is swinging backward. And it, it's quite obvious that those things are all connected. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's all fascial, right? And there is spirals in every component of human movement, right? And it's the spiral that is really creating energy. And I'm sure you've heard the saying that power lies within the transverse plane, or not, maybe. <laughs> I think I heard Wex say that. Okay, right? Yeah. So the power lies within the transverse plane, which just means that power is rotation, right? Mm -hmm. So the pitchers, like they're winding up, they're spiraling. So then they're essentially potentiating in that spiral, mm -hmm. right? Another thing to think about too is like if you've ever seen, for all of you guys who like the real football, soccer, if you've ever seen like somebody take a free kick or somebody just like hit a, like mm -hmm. really take a good mm -hmm. kick, the, that mm -hmm. foot comes all the way here yeah. mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, it's the hips are spiraling and that would forward. hurt someone's back if they don't have the conditioning to do that, right? Absolutely. Yep. You're going to throw so. something out, hurt yourself, hurt your knee, hurt your hip. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We actually have, of all the sports, baseball, the pitchers love Naboso because mm. they understand that foot core hand connection and the ability or the need to feel the foot placement as they're releasing the ball is really, really interesting. Yeah, when you run, you kind of will notice some of this stuff too as you're mentioning these uh, rotations. Mm -hmm. If you can get yourself to rotate and to just loosen up a bit, it feels effortless when you're running. Yeah. And there's other times where you might be out and run and your body might be kind of stiff and not feeling great. And it's hard to get those rotations and you'll notice that you're kind of all fucked up when you're like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the part of the walking that I was talking about with kind of walking and impact and, and stuff like that is that walking is spiral it's a rotation moment like we're obviously moving sagittally because we're moving forward yeah. but there are this movement of the foot drives rotations up the leg which creates rotation in the pelvis so your pelvis actually has this motion like this and the t-spine has to rotate at that same time as that nutation counter nutation of your pelvis mm -hmm. so there's so much as far as spiraling mm -hmm. most of my gait assessments i'm looking for that spiral and if it's locked in one joint all the other joints get locked what's up power project family it's time to stop dressing like you're a fucking preschooler and step your game up by checking out <laughs> viore clothing now i'm not one to talk i wear a fucking pink hat that has a dog on it but at the end of the day at least my shirt and shorts are popping. So head to Viore because they have great stuff for your top and your bottom. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you guys got to head over to viore.com slash power project. That's V U O R I dot com slash power project. And you guys will automatically receive 20% off your order. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let's get back to the podcast. Let's talk about walking real quick because we've talked about walking a lot on the show. Mark does a lot of walking and running. A lot of people in the audience are used to just walking every single day as just a habit, it's something that we need to do. But um, what would your suggestion be to people for maybe how they should try to be striking the ground? And I know that there's, it's too broad of a question because everybody has their different movement inefficiencies because of maybe certain things in the gym. So maybe their feet are turned out, et cetera. But what should we ideally be looking for when we're striking the ground, when we're moving forward in space? So first one is to find the rhythm. So walking is supposed to be rhythmic. Mm -hmm. um, second big thing is you have to take sufficient strides or steps. A stride is actually two steps, but 
um, a sufficient step length. Yeah. So if you do not take a sufficient step, and maybe you don't because you don't have big toe range of motion, that'll jack it up, mm -hmm. right? But you have to be able to take a long step to force the other arm across. Or do this in it, right? So I can get mm -hmm. this reciprocal pattern between here. If I can't take a long step, there's no need for me to rotate my T-spine. So that that just shot everything, mm -hmm. right? Um, when we take long steps and we get that reciprocal swing mechanically, like biomechanically, that's where the spiral's created. But that's also how your fascia, so the spiraling that Mark was just talking about with the pictures is really fascial and mechanical, mm -hmm. right? So then that's how you load your fascia. So if you start to shorten your stride so that it's stochotic. I actually think that the way that people now walk in modern society is actually a huge hindrance on movement longevity and anti-aging and all of that because we just don't have the, the wringing out of the fascial rag or you don't get a sufficient pump up to the brain for cerebral blood flow. Like there's this whole like cascade of events that happens if you don't walk the right way and at the simplest you know, requirements of walking the right way mm -hmm. is stride length or step length and the speed that is associated with that. Got it. And yeah. how about the, what do you see when people are striking the ground, especially like, what do you see with the big foot? What do you see with the way that the foot strikes the ground? What should they be trying to do? Uh, let me talk about the push off first. Push off first. Okay. okay. So push off. So that's when you're releasing. Mm -hmm. Can I show that again? Uh, yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind. Okay. Just get a little bit more in the middle. More in the middle? Yeah. There, you're perfect. Here? Yeah, yeah. and then I'll. Okay. So, a ideal push off position is this, right? So, I'm here. Mm -hmm. This is called a high gear. This is a high gear push off, right? I'm efficient. I'm going sagittal. All my energy is going forward, right? Think yeah. like professional athlete, sprinter, mark. Right, running forward here, okay? A lot of people push off like this. This is called a low gear. Ooh. So they're going around the She toe. just rotated her heel inward and her toes outward so I'm like, on her back foot. A lot of professional athletes do this. Look at soccer and football. Mm -hmm. We'll do this because they can't flex the cleat. So they rotate around the side of the cleat and then look at that does for my knee. Yep, it, the right? pressure in the knee. Look what that does. If I'm doing this, look what that does to the whole inside of my foot, my post and tib. Instead, you want access to your glute, right? And you want to flick yeah. the heel more outward and push off the big toe. Is that right? Yes. So if we talk biomechanics for a moment, when I do this, right, and I do a high gear and I dorsiflex my big toe, I supinated and locked my rear foot which created an external rotation moment into the glute, plus I'm extending, mm -hmm. right? I get maximal extension. When I do this, I actually just started to internally rotate my lower extremity, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So high gear, low gear is huge. Um, I've actually worked with- um, So you're trying to get like a good amount of hip extension well, yeah, so in that movement, right? Hip extension is directly linked to the first MPJ or the big toe. If you don't have the big toe, you're not going to get the hip extension, which means you shorten your step, you become very anterior in your movements, you become very anterior dominant. Do you Just think, think of it's reciprocal a inhibition. Good idea to try to actively squeeze your butt, uh, <laughs> dorsiflex your foot as you're walking or running. What do you mean? Or is that something you don't need to really think about? Uh, pick up your foot as you swing forward. Mm. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, like in so like in throwing right you're like why are we why are we pitching our arm way back like you're you're doing a lot of external rotation to wind up wind up a ton of internal rotation are we doing something right. similar when we're running should we you know and so should you kind of try to use your foot as like a little bit of a spring do you think um or is that too much thinking just in walking <laughs> yeah so here's the other thing so walking is very subconscious mm hmm so anytime a patient comes, I've had patients come into my office trying to be really con conscious and they're walking and I was like, can you just get in the office, please? Like you cannot, yeah, 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 yeah. You cannot walk like <laughs> going through every <coughs> step, right, you right. know, right? We can't do that, right? Um, but I don't think that, this is where I would be a little bit hesitant around 
picking the foot up is because one of the compensation patterns that I see in walkers and runners, really more so in runners where it becomes an issue, is that they enter swing too early. Mm -hmm. And if you enter swing too early because that's what you're focusing on, that's going to lead to other stresses in the body. Might heel strike and whatnot. Yeah. 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 Got it. Um, I was curious about this. The When you mentioned the thing about flat foot, when I was a teenager, um, I was told I had flat feet. I was given orthotics and all of that. Um, but one thing, when we started doing all this stuff with our feet last year, I noticed that, number one, my foot striking changed, and even the imprints that I would see on my different sandals and mm -hmm. different shoes, like I now had an arch because of all the activity that was now going on. So a lot of people are told they have flat feet and they're given orthotics. I know you mentioned sometimes orthotics are necessary, but how should those people with flat feet address their flat feet if that's even a thing? Yeah. Well, one, I'm curious. Can I see your feet? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll take mm -hmm. these. Uh, we'll take these off real quick. I'm using the uh, Naboso. I got it. I got the ball in half, and I'm I'm stretching my big toe as we speak. <laughs> there you go. Yes. What should I do with my feet? All right. I just want you to stand there. Okay. Nope, just stand. So she's. Uh, She's kind of checking out his feet here. And then can you turn to face that way? Analysis of the foot going on. Mm -hmm. okay. Play by play. Good. So I, um, I would actually call that more of like a pancake foot. What's a pancake foot? Mm, <laughs> I love delicious. pancakes. <laughs> I, um, pancakes are tasty, so we're on, some we're butter. winning right yes. here. <laughs> Some syrup. <laughs> he does have syrup in his like desk right oh, here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let's cut. <laughs> oh, let's cut uh, those Ms. Butterworths sugar free. That's mm. the good stuff there. Pancake feet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what so are pancake, pancake feet? Foot. Pancake Mark's foot. staring yes. at you. <laughs> All right. It's like the cartoons, like when they're uh, starving and yeah. the guy turns into like a hamburger <laughs> <laughs> with the butter on top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yes, so I classify flat feet, which again means nothing. So when people say, oh, I have flat feet, like what does that mean, right? Yeah, Are people you... kind of say it as if it's a bad thing and you're just saying it maybe doesn't mean right. like a it whole doesn't, lot. It, yeah, it has no, I have no context for that because mm -hmm. there's so many different subcategories of flatter feet, let's say. Um, so I, it, what you have is no arch. Just because you don't have a arch and when I say an arch you do like if you I I was listening to one of the episodes where you were showing on your shoes your imprint and you can see it right yeah. so it's not like your navicular an entire medial plantar foot is on the floor mm -hmm. you have a lower arch right okay fine right your navicular position is not as high as maybe mine yeah that's fine right that's your foot but what I look for is this overpronation moment Okay, and the overpronation moment is the spiral component that we were kind of talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So do you have a shift in the direction of eversion internal rotation, which is part of pronation, okay? Now, when I see that on someone's foot, I then want to understand, is it flexible or is it rigid? Certain people's feet is overpronated with the spiral in a rigid form. Ooh. That's typically yeah. like a later stage. They have severe pain because all of the joints are arthritic, mm -hmm. but that's like a later stage, but it's a foot that you have to understand, right? And then the opposite of that or what typically happens before that is a flexible. So that would be someone where if they look at their foot and they're like, woo, look at that arch. I got yeah. a nice, beautiful arch. And then they stand up and they go boom. Mm -hmm. But when they collapse, they're like mm. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not doing that. Yeah. Right? So they have- If I did that, that I could I could feel if I do you that. You would feel if you did that, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. you have, you know, eversion, internal rotation. There's a spiral moment to it. Mm -hmm. It's flexible though, because if I just look at your foot, it's neutral. No gravity, no body weight. You stand up, boom. Yeah. Right? Then you have to say, well, why is that happening in that person? Mm -hmm. Do they have a weak foot? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe in certain cases. Or the big one is they might have an element of ligament laxity. And this is the big one that a lot of people overlook or forget, mm -hmm. right? Ligament laxity is oftentimes genetic, right? So we all have connective tissue 
properties that are genetic. And in certain people, the ligaments where we have over 100 ligaments in your foot are just a little bit too flexible yeah. to support all of your body weight, force, acceleration, gravity, all of that, that it just starts to kind of collapse in the spiral. Mm. That is very different than someone who it's muscle weakness. Okay, Muscle weakness, strengthen the foot, strengthen the post tip, strengthen the core, strengthen the glutes, and you can help to derotate them. But we're strengthening the derotators of the foot yeah. to then stabilize the foot. Now, a pancake foot... That's just my term. Mm -hmm. That's not like a medical <laughs> term. <laughs> so if you go to another podiatrist and be like, I have a pancake, have a foot. pancake <laughs> foot, they'll be like, I don't know what you're talking about. So a pancake foot is, so this was frontal transverse, mm -hmm. right? Our planes. Yours is sagittal. Yours is just genetic. Your bones were developed with a slight sorry if this is confusing, a slight declination to the bone. So instead of them being inclined, this is your arch, right? Mm -hmm. They're just a little bit declinated. Yes. Okay? That's just part of your structure. Okay? Okay. So your foot does not tolerate orthotics. I would never give a foot like yours orthotics because I know that it Thanks, wouldn't Doc. work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Appreciate it. If you the years of fucking orthotics as a teenager. <laughs> fuck you, bro. I'm joking. <laughs> but not joking. Anyway, let's keep on. If find you, that guy. Yeah, I need a, need a fucking strangle. You, oh, boy. That's <laughs> 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 my name. <laughs> <laughs> if you try to put something like a hard piece of plastic, that's what orthotics are, right? Mm -hmm. They're like a stiff, thick, hard piece of plastic trying to drive your arch up. Let me just force these bones up. But the bones are technically like parallel to the ground. That's your structure. Yeah. I can't move that shit, right? So you have to understand that. Now, could we build a little bit of intrinsic muscle strength? You've already said you've done that, right? Yeah. Can I strengthen the glutes? Can I get my feet connected to my core? Absolutely, right? And I see tons of high-level athletes with your exact same feet. And really my colleagues who in school, we would be like, orthotics, <clears throat> orthotics, would be like, how does that athlete not have injuries? Mm. I'm like, because it's, they don't have that spiraling internal rotation, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's how I start to look at quote unquote flat feet. Mm. Yeah, the arches of our feet are supposed to be non-weight bearing, but for some people, if their foot is pronated a certain way or if they don't have a super high arch, then that area of the foot is going to be weight bearing to some extent, right? Correct. Yes. And, and so therefore they might need a uh, different kind of help than the next person, right? Yeah. So I, I will typically teach people how to find their passive pressure distribution. And I'll just have them stand. I typically have them stand on an obosa mat because it'll force them to feel mm -hmm. the weight distribution. And they'll just stand with their feet shoulder width apart with the eyes shut and just totally relaxed, right? Passive, relaxed, and just take an assessment and feel where is your body's pressure, right? Do you have more in one foot versus the other foot? Maybe the front of the feet or the back of the feet on the inside or the outside. So you're just doing like a self-check. Mm -hmm. And then it often helps people realize, okay, if I have a standing desk or when I move, when I'm cooking, brushing my teeth, whatever, where they're standing passive, this is where my body weight wants to sit. And then I can understand the effect on the rest of the body. Yeah. Where my default, I like to shift to the side of my feet. I have a higher arch. Right. So my passive, it actually feels like I'm like this. I'm not all the way in a on the side of my feet, but that's where the tendency is. That's it. So yeah. it'll be up into my IT band mm -hmm. and then into my hips. So if I'm like, damn it, why are my hips always so tight? Like my glutes. Oh, okay, because when I stand, I'm passively in this inverted supinated position. So I need to be like, okay, tripod, spread it out, find a stable centered base. Mm -hmm. And then there we go. So just just because you say I have a neutral foot with an arch doesn't mean I ever need to reset my base or find my base or level out my base. I need to do that as well because I passively shift this way and maybe you don't see it. Yeah. What are some things we can do for the big toe? You mentioned it a bunch of times, and I know some people are a little crazy about it. And it's my understanding that if we can get uh, some separation between the big toe and uh, the other toes, sometimes that can help create a little bit of an arch. And it just gives us, I think, more options in how our foot is making contact with the ground. So what are some things that we should maybe focus on with the big toe? 
Yeah. So the big toe, you do want to have what's called centration, like a center joint. You don't want it kind of deviating out to the side, which is a bunion, right? When you have a bunion, you actually pull the most important intrinsic muscle in your foot, which is called your abductor hallucis. Yeah, I see that and a lot where the toe is, uh, the big toe is pointed towards the other toes. Yes, right? yep. So if the first goes towards the second and it starts to angulate, mm. part of what also shifts with it, it, with it is there's these two little bones on the bottom of your foot called sesamoids. Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard of like sesamoiditis or sesamoid Sounds fractures. Sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> it's like your patella. Your patella is a sesamoid bone, mm. right? So it's just a floating bone. Mm. But we have these little sesamoids that your muscles run through. And when you have a bunion, those shift over. And the muscle that shifts over is your arch stabilizing muscle. So if any of the intrinsic muscles of people are like, I hate anatomy, sorry. It is your abductor hallucis which runs along the inside. So it's here. Mm. That's your abductor hallucis, okay? So that muscle attaches to one of your sesamoids. Mm -hmm. And when your sesamoids move, when you have a bunion, that muscle gets like shifted over here. So what I tell people is to try to engage a muscle that is in a lengthened position. The analogy I always give is because I know you guys will get this, is you have, you know, the person at the gym and they set up like the pec deck machine, yeah, yeah, yeah. like way far back here. And then they're <laughs> like, right. You, there's got to have like a length tension relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens essentially to the abductor hallucis when someone has a bunion. Yeah. Right. So align the joint toe spacers. I know you <laughs> like Navosa's yeah, play. I love those things, yeah. Yes. So toe spacers such as warm the on the play. plane. I know, I saw the video, right? <laughs> yeah, warm war walking in the airport and stuff. It feels great like to wear yeah. them and actually have, you know, move around in them is what I would advise people to try to do. Right, yeah. So when you have a bunion, a bunion is actually progressive. So every step that you take, you're, you're essentially making your bunion worse. Mm. Even if you're in minimal shoes and all of that, if you have a bunion and you walk on it, it is progressing with every step that you take. Yeah. Because you're just feeding the beast in a sense, right? So using something like the Naboso splay can pull it into a more centered position to restrict the muscle imbalance that's essentially driving it. Quick question about this because um, you know I have a friend actually. We were we, he was just at my house this morning and looking at his feet, his big toe is literally points. Both his big toes are pointing towards the other toes, and you can see that he has a bunion on it, right? Um, I know that you can't say how long th things like this should take, but I, it will take people a while if they do have that to make this shift. How should they try? How often should they be using this? Like, should they just be using it when they're sitting at their desk, etc.? And what kind of change can they expect to see through the years? Yeah. Like, can that toe actually come back to where it should be as an adult? Okay. So here's the thing with bunions. Uh -huh. is, so our goal with bunions is that we want to push pause on them. Uh, you just want, don't want it to keep going in that direction. Yeah. Can we just like pause everything, right? Don't through, get any worse. Don't get any worse. Right? Are there going to be some mild ones that will you'll send me a before and after and be like, oh my God, I corrected my bunion? Sure, that's mild, mm -hmm. right? But when it starts to cross this point of perhaps what your friend has, right, or what stereotypically people think of as bunions, you're trying to push pause, yeah. right? So I tell them to use the splay 30 minutes, right? Just see how you feel, walk around your home, sit on the couch, whatever it is, just to see how you respond to it. If you like it, slowly increase that time, right? And then start to use it when walking around if you can, because again, bunions are progressive when you walk. Mm -hmm. So we need to resist that in your shoes. So you have to wear a more minimal shoe, right? Yeah. It's not gonna wear in a traditional, or fit in a traditional shoe, but the more you can wear it, the better, especially during times of movement, mm -hmm. walking, working out, things like that. Do you run with yours? I have, yeah, I have yeah. done that before. It's a little bit challenging sometimes because then you need a shoe that uh, is really wide. Mm. Okay. So I can do it in my Shama uh, sandals. Mm. These are Shama's guys. I'm pretty sure our code is Power Project. So these you can wear them mm -hmm. with these on. Yep. And they're flat. They're wide. They're fucking amazing. Shockingly comfortable. Mm -hmm. Your Shockingly feet comfortable. Um, with the toe splay while you're running mm -hmm. feels amazing. Um, and if someone can do it on a field, again, like <laughs> do barefoot stuff on appropriate 
land in mm-hmm. accordance to like where you're at in your own foot training. But uh, for me, I've used those toast blades um, uh, on a field, and that felt amazing. And it felt like it 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 uh, it felt like a lot of individual stretching for my toes, but mm-hmm. it felt good. Like it didn't it didn't hurt. It didn't feel like I was ripping anything apart or anything. It felt it felt comfortable. And then when I was in uh, Hawaii recently, I ran in the sandals with the toast blades uh-huh. on and that felt mm. incredible as well. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. yeah, I mean, your plantar fascia runs from your heel and then inserts into the base of your toes. Mm-hmm. So when you stretch with the toe spacers, you're actually stretching your plantar fascia. Mm. So it's one of the treatments I give for plantar fasciitis is as part of this, like the four quadrants I spoke about of those four things, is to also use toe spacers to stretch the plantar fascia mm-hmm. or it's a prevention technique for plantar fasciitis. So what have you seen with improvements in terms of uh, people doing some myofascial release on the foot? Because the ball that you gave us has a little tiny ball inside mm-hmm. of it. There's and one that, right behind you. That you little tiny uh, pebble thing that's in there is uh, <laughs> is excruciating to roll around on. Yeah, we have one out. Oh, you have? Yeah. Oh, you don't want to touch mine, though. I've been, yeah. Pull this crack Yeah, the one I'm down here <laughs> okay. is disgusting. Yeah, so um, <laughs> yeah. Emily made a, a ball that has uh, some proprioception <laughs> uh, spikes on it. The spikes are not yeah. anything that are going to hurt. They... Feel great. They, they feel good. They uh, do have a sensation, but they yes. don't hurt. Yeah. And then the ball splits in half, and then it has a tiny little Russian doll inside. You don't <laughs> hurt if your feet are weak. I yeah. hate to be mean. I'm joking. Yes. Yeah, so but I'm not also joking. <laughs> My feet. It's just truth. I hurt. So really, the the, <laughs> the power in this is that it's not, obviously, it's not just the ball, uh-huh. is that it's splitting into the two domes. And then the point of the two domes is that we really want to emphasize pinpoint pressure release. Mm -hmm. So to roll your foot, if I made this in a ball again, Mm -hmm. space here, if I just roll the foot like this, Mm -hmm. I'm not getting the same release as if I sit here, place it down, and then I can actually just put full body weight, right? Release, especially like this one. Oh my God. When it's up here in this point and I just really put my pressure and I force my met heads to like really open up. It feels insane. Like I, for me, I feel it like go up my leg. Yeah. Yeah. Like I actually feel it like sometimes in my groin and I'm like, holy shit, what am I doing? That's (laughs) what Mark and I are always doing behind the desk. Mm -hmm. That's why you like see us like moving around like this. And and we look like we're going to cry. Yeah. (laughs) We look like we were just doing some weird shit. It's because like we've been smashing our feet on this and this little one that you're talking about, Mark. Yeah. Oh, this is yeah. this is this is amazing. I got something weird going on in my foot on the outside of my right foot. That's where I can't move my pinky toe. So I think I need to get that to release, and then yeah. I think I'll have magical powers with that pinky toe. Yep, hundred <laughs> percent. Next but, time you see me, I'll have magical. I'm going to be able to levitate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to expect it. So with this, also though, you want to do the pinpoint pressure. You don't want to roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I mean, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I can't tell you. But you don't want to do. crush yourself. Right, but. You know, the pinpoint pressure does give a much more effective release. And then the the texture that is on this is stimulating the muscles, obviously stimulating the nerves. But one of my favorite aspects is it's stimulating circulation. Mm. And that is one of the most underappreciated aspects of recovery and foot function and your plantar fascia and just everything just from the ground up is you have to have good microcirculation. Yeah. So really all of the Naboso products increase circulation to the feet. I want to also say like the really the really cool aspects about like what's been going on with us using like the mat using the ball. I haven't been able to use those socks yet, but the amazing thing that's been happening is like the toes are just moving more now because of the proprioceptive feedback from the mats standing on the mats like I notice during podcast during just chilling the toes are just always moving. I, I I think like my toes have moved more in a single month than they have <laughs> ye- like in a year, years ago, just because mm-hmm. like now, even I even noticed this when I, before using these products, when I started using barefoot shoes, um, I was noticing and using toe socks instead, I was noticing, oh, my toes are starting to move more than they ever have. And I'm actually paying attention to it. Mm-hmm. But now because of the sensory feedback, my toes just literally want to mm-hmm. grab this mat when that when the ball is cut in half, like mm-hmm. when my feet are on top of it. My toes are now just grabbing the ball as I'm talking. It's just consistently the feet are doing shit, yep. you know? So it's 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 a big deal. The sensory feedback from the mats and the products, it, it, it makes a difference. Yeah, no, definitely does. And that's where 
I call it, you know, if you can check more boxes, I'm all about efficiency. I had mentioned mm -hmm. that before. That if someone is like, ah, I use a lacrosse ball, I use a golf ball, like I'm doing the same thing, mm -hmm. right? That you're saying that you're using a smooth or essentially an inert object, mm -hmm. right? Like, yes, it's doing like the deep pressure release, but if you could add in the texture and the pyramids to stimulate the nerves and to just wake up and get this proprioceptive and this whole like neurological and circulatory, like why why would you not if you're going to do a foot release anyway? Yeah. Like that, that's how mm -hmm. I look at it because again, just check more boxes, you get that additional benefit to it. And then the, the texture that we use, the height, shape, distance is very specific. This is not just a random texture that we it kind of it kind of grabs and pulls your skin, which is another yeah, factor it, in yep, myofascial has, release. Has an effect opinion. on it, yes. Um, the nerve that we're actually stimulating is the same nerve that reads Braille in your hand. Wait, what? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it is. <laughs> 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 so we have a nerve. We have special nerves in our fingers yeah. and in oh, our feet. Oh, I can see what this is saying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the eyes and read. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so these it's these so nerves. <laughs> It's actually two-point discrimination. So if you take, you have the, the stick and the ball, whichever, right? Mm -hmm. And you just squeeze it and then you look at your hand yeah, and you get yeah. this little like mm -hmm. indents, mm -hmm. right? So those are essentially that kind of like two-point pattern, right? Braille in a sense, is stimulating a very specific nerve in the hands and the feet that reads two-point discrimination. That's what we're stimulating. It's not really texture. Mm -hmm. That's like a layman's term, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. It's two-point discrimination. It's and the bumps on the sidewalk for, uh, I think it's for people that are blind, right? The bumps on the crosswalks, near the crosswalks. On the floor? Like, yeah, yeah like on the, the ground. Orange, yellowish. Yeah, I think those are, you know, you but, you but you feel those. You feel the discrepancy between that and the regular ground. Ah, yes. So, and I, I, I maybe that's a Sacramento thing. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think, well, yeah. And Phoenix were just like, hey, go at yeah, it. Yeah, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good luck. Um, but... Yeah, the subtlety of it is also very important. Mm -hmm. And that's where, like, if people look at the products, because I'm sure some people do, and think of it as kind of gimmicky, mm. like, how can something like this help someone with a stroke walk better? Or like our insoles, mm -hmm. right? Like, if they look at the insole and say, there's no way that this is going to help someone who has neuropathy feel their feet again. And then they see our videos. Oh, there. Okay. Yes. Great job with the videos, by the way, uh, <laughs> because the, on each product you have, there's a, a, a QR code or whatever the yep. hell they're called, and you can put your phone to it and it links you to the website, yep. which so gives you, know you a how video. To, you know how great. to use it. Yeah. 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 So we're, there's a lot of science in our products, and we're actually doing various research studies to really demonstrate it. Neurologists who see this, like a neurologist would be like, I don't know how this works, right? They're like, I like it seems like something that would be gimmicky, but they're like, my patients are bringing it in and my patients can actually feel their feet mm. and they see the difference in the movement that if a neurologist is saying that, I mean, that's so that's why we're doing various research studies. So and powerful stuff. A, a, just another just cool thing about that ball is that like when it's on the ground, I mean, things that we're doing is like you can literally use it to push your big toe down on mm -hmm. and get a big stretch in the big toe. I also use it to like get like my big toes here and my other toes on the other side. So it stretches out the toes in that way, too. And you can legit stand in that way. There's there's a lot of things that you can passively like. Mm -hmm. Number one, we always talk to people about trying to get a desk riser. Right. And standing when they're working. Yep. So now when you're doing that, your feet. Over time, mm -hmm. you're not thinking about things, but your feet as you're typing or you're on the phone or whatever, your feet are doing all these things, yeah. whereas typically your feet are usually in a shoe and they're static all day long. So just think about this action, this, these small little actions that your feet are taking mm -hmm. and the feelings your feet are getting compounded week by week, month by month, year mm -hmm. by year, and the difference that can make in a longer period of time, not just in a week. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these are really like lifestyle changes like yeah. that's what i try yeah. to teach people when i give a patient a protocol this is not like two weeks four weeks till your pain goes away like i teach them things that are really intended to be for the rest of their life habits yeah like a healthy mm -hmm. habit or a ritual yeah. call it what you want but that's really that's where the change happens want to try something cool sure <laughs> <laughs> take your uh, <laughs> take one foot and put it on top of the other foot okay <laughs> and dig your heel into the top of your foot and just stretch the <laughs> shit out of your skin okay you feel some good, like, 
almost like myofascial type stuff uh-huh. uh, going on, like a little bit of little bit of pain, right? <laughs> Uh, we had someone come in. Uh, Gary, like, Shut- hu- yeah. Gary Lehman. Human, human Garage. Human Garage. They were teaching us some of that. Interesting. To yeah, try well, to get to that top of that foot. Feels- yeah, the, the top of the foot is hard to release. So I actually like yeah. that, right? The reason why I like that is that the top of the foot, the skin is obviously very different than the planter, mm-hmm. right? Because this is attached. This mm-hmm. is very thin. The nerves also sit really close to the surface. So if you were to, on the top of your foot, sit and just kind of like hit with your nail, yeah. every once in a while you'll hit a nerve and it'll zing, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So to take a mild roller, I wouldn't even take this. I probably would not take the stick and like roll the yeah, top of your too foot. too sensitive. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to hit the nerve. So I like that. Yeah, just pulling right? the skin and just kind of moving around a little bit with some yep. light pressure. Yep, you wanna, you free. Wanna, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say free it up. Yeah. Right? Get the circulation. You want to take it to level three real quick? All right, put that ball under your foot. Mm. Find a certain point, stick half the ball under your foot, then take your other foot. Oh and uh, I've been doing this. I've been oh, doing yeah, this. Smash it's downward. Smash downward yeah. on it. Like, yeah. like use your other foot to smash on top of your foot. That's on top of the ball. Oh, oh baby. Trying to, a lot of weight, trying to make it's a lot of weight on there. Yeah, yeah, over pressure that, that ball, bitch. Make that ball disappear under your foot. Serious, <laughs> dude. It feels <laughs> amazing. That. So that's you so can good. find those certain points that like, you're like, ooh, that, that's a point. And uh, okay, I don't want anyone to do anything dangerous here, but like literally all I've been doing back mm-hmm. here has just been one foot on the ball, yeah. other foot on top of that foot, and just smashing that I've, foot into that bitch. I've done a little too much on <laughs> some of this stuff before, and all it does is make you a little sore. Mm. Like I have, you know, you're not going to... And if something's real sketchy, as uh, our buddy Kelly Sturet says, if it's sketchy, it's sketchy. Just back off. Of it. Yeah, just yeah. back off. If something right. feels really weird. That's not right. You got to move on. Yeah. You just you're not using, to your body. You're not using a uh, weighted vest, though, in SEMA, so you got ah. to step it up. <laughs> you need to use a weighted vest. Holding a 225-pound oh, yeah. barbell in your hands. Yeah. While squeezing a fucking gripper on the other hand. <laughs> and yeah. flexing your taint. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, good one. I wanted to ask you about my left foot. So um, for the most part, all my toes are are in in an agreement to point about the same direction but my pinky toe went rogue <laughs> and so like they're all about this way right and it's like we're gonna do this uh. and it's like uh i don't know it looks, it looks like it's maybe someone else's foot all of a sudden because it just like wants to it totally turned and it's no matter what i've done i mean it's only been not even a year, right? We're still very new to all Isn't of this. Isn't that the little piggy that ran all the way home? It He ran home. Yeah. <laughs> all, <laughs> all the other piggies are still at the club and he's, he's he ran home. But yeah, is, what what can I do to uh, kind of straighten that guy out before his life is over and he starts going down the wrong path? Yes. So <laughs> that is a varus rotation to your fifth. Like, that's essentially would be the diagnosis. Those are very hard to derotate. And the reason is that there's no muscle that's really opposing to pull it into that derotated position. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say toe spacers, doing the myofascial work, do the upgraded SEMA version of yeah. pushing down if you want <laughs> with the with the other one. But you know, I would say the consistency of that to see if you can get a little bit of articulation into that digit. The derotation, though is really hard because again there's no muscle that that pulls your fifth digit in that direction is there anything in the shin to help move that around at all or not really the fifth digit yeah i don't know to move like how far up does it go yeah to move the toes around i don't know a little control panel that's in a because some like you know if you squeeze your forearm there's shit in there that moves your fingers Mm -hmm. around right yeah, I mean, you have your flexor digitorum longus, your Mm -hmm. extensor digitorum longus, but the quinty so you have a flexor digitorum quinti, and you have an abductor digiti quinti. Like yeah. these are really small muscles, mm. and their job is to like move the toe out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? That's literally mm-hmm. all that their job is, but it's a intrinsic action. It's mm-hmm. not a oh. extrinsic action, right? Yeah. But it's something like, I mean, because – if, yeah, in my opinion, if you were to take both of my sides, it's actually the better side. The right side, after running with Mark and looking at the video, I was like, oh my gosh, my right foot is just like, it again, it feels like it's someone else's. Like it's not even on this body. But my right side feels fine, fine-ish, and it's the less sore side from that run. So, I mean, should I be like too concerned about that pinky toe? Mm, right now I wouldn't. Yeah, and then also I'm not like going to be competing in anything. You know, it's just mainly to try to get myself out of pain is all. 
Yeah. So I would I would do the spacers releasing, kind of stay with what you're doing. Mm-hmm. See if you can start to get some connection. Um, you know, you can maybe do some work along here. I would say try some acupuncture if you want. Try to get in there a little bit with some needles. Right? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. What have you seen for uh, helping people with their feet and the uh, impact that it has on like knees and impact it has on mm. hips and impact has on uh, low back? I mean, obviously, so connected. Yeah. Both fascially and mechanically. A lot of that has to do with the foot type, the foot type and the joint coupling, right? Over pronation, internal rotation. Now you have these knees collapsing in, uh, increased. Uh, external rotation maybe into the hips. So I see a lot of pelvis-based things. Um, Pelvises can get locked based off of foot and ankle function. I'd probably say more so ankle than foot. So limited ankle mobility is a huge driver to Mm. the way that people stand. Um, Anyone who walks like a duck and turns their feet out or Mm. has to squat really wide, or they do a lot of, to show you, Mm. Oh, like a like a smoky. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of y'all understand so lucky, that. Right? Yeah. So, but they're they're really tight. And yeah. I see this. This has to be with a lot of the limbs mm-hmm. that you see, right? Oh like yeah, they ducking. Very <laughs> tight, and they could like crack a coconut on their glutes. Like mm-hmm. they're, they're tight back there, but. The, that tight glue. I'm always thinking I could put like just a little tiny bit of pressure like on their leg and they would just hit the ground. <laughs> yeah, because <'cause laughs> everything's so, so yeah. Yeah, stiff and tightened. But that external yeah. rotation into the hip mm. is actually locking their pelvis. Mm. So, and that's huge. That's needed for walking. That's mm. just for fluidity of movement is you have to have your pelvis shifting. So I see a lot of SI joint, low back issues from the ankle meaning they don't have that ankle mobility, so they're rotating out. Mm. I see that a lot, yeah. And then I don't know if any of the listeners or you guys have had anyone kind of talking about the anterior pubic and like groin stress no. and stuff like that. I don't remember. Like adductor longus mm-hmm. strains and things like that. Um, I had in 2012, are you guys familiar with athletic pubalgia or sports hernia? Not yeah. really. We sports. haven't had people talk about it much. Oh, okay. So yeah. a sports hernia is a a true sports hernia is a tear in this in the rectus abdominis fascia. So as it's coming into its insertion in the pubic bone, you would actually tear the fascia of that rectus abdominis and the internal external obliques as they come in. You'll see this a lot in hockey, soccer, football, cyclists. So certain sports. Um, and I had it as I was did competitive cycling. I was a gymnast, so I trained my abs in a very Maybe specific way. a little lower than like hip bone? No, so the, the pain is actually right right at your pubic Got bone. It. Not not the pubic symphysis, but the, there's a pubic tubercle mm-hmm. and right above that. And that has to do with pelvic floor, the timing of rectus abdominis obliques and adductor longus. So adductor longus, spasms, strains, they're always getting issue in the adductor longus. A lot of that leads into this risk of athletic pubalgia. And because I started talking about it, I get tons of people, like every week I will get people that will message me and say, I heard your YouTube video, I heard your story that you had this, I need help, my doctor's not Mm -hmm. really like paying attention to me. Um, It's an injury that's often associated with men, so my orthopedist was like, you don't have athletic pubalgia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, no, I think I do, like looking at everything. And I had to go to the top uh, surgeon and researcher in athletic pubalgia. His name is Dr. William Myers out of Pennsylvania. He has a new special MRI scan that's just slightly angled different to pick up this injury. Yeah. And then he repairs it in a very specific way that's different than other hernias. So it can't be meshed like other hernias. Mm-hmm. It has to be reapproximated. And anyway, it is very much associated with a lot of anterior hip labral issues. And most people will actually tear their labrum and tear their rectus abdominis fascia in the same injury. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that is driven through the timing of the pelvic floor. So this is what led to me to look at the foot 
to the pelvic floors because I was putting so much attention on, okay, what is the function of my pelvic floor, my psoas, my adductor longus, and the order in which they were engaging to stabilize my pelvis when I was cycling or when I was running or whatever it was that I was doing. Mm -hmm. So that's an area that I actually will see podiatrically if I have a patient with non-responding plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendonitis for years, and then I start asking them and I say, do you have groin pain, right? Do you have any issues with your adductors? And I will get patients that will say, I have these issues. I've had groin pain for years. And I mention it to you know this doctor, that doctor, and they don't know what the hell with the anatomy of the, the anterior pubic, that they just go completely undiagnosed. And I've sent patients to Dr. Myers, had the MRI, sure enough, they had athletic pubalgia. Hmm. And I'm like, a podiatrist <laughs> was like recommending them yeah. because of seeing non-responding foot pain for years. Something's feeding that beast and it's usually something higher up in the pelvis. Okay. So uh, would some beneficial aspects be like just like strengthening the muscles in that area? But what, what do people actually do to get rid of it over time? Yeah, so from a prevention, a powerful core is one that has to be stabilized in proper sequence, mm -hmm. which means you need the deeper stabilizers to contract first, and then the larger stabilized kind of cascade off of that. Yeah. And that's why I focus so much on the foot to pelvic floor is because if the pelvic floor and the diaphragm are not the first muscles to engage or stabilize or to be, you know, kind of activated, mm -hmm. the rest of the cascade starts to starts to shift. If your obliques engage before your pelvic floor, you're not stable. If your glutes before your pelvic floor, you're not stable, right? And that's why I, I'm very particular on how I cue things. Mm -hmm. um, you know the monster band walk. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So the monster band walk that a lot of people will use is they'll say like, oh, I have weak glutes um, and therefore I sprain my ankle or I have weak glutes. So I have knee pain. I have weak glutes because of blah, blah, blah. Right. So their physical therapist has them do monster band walks and they're just feeding the beast like mm -hmm. the problem, because unless you're doing that monster band walk and engaging your foot and lifting your pelvic floor and exhaling at a really specific moment, you're not feeding the actual neuromuscular cascade of how you actually stabilize. And that is that is the most pivotal part. And I think what's missed in traditional physical therapy is you can't just like release, do some clamshells, do some mm -hmm. glute bridges and like, there you go, right? It's too disconnected. Yeah, it has to be, it, it has to start from the way that these muscles actually stabilize and they stabilize in gravity. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting someone up and saying like, okay, here's the ground, here's gravity, here's my foundation, and here's my center of mass. How are they all kind of connecting to each other? Yeah. Right? So I, I actually do treat a lot of pelvic issues mm -hmm. because they come in with a secondary or maybe it's probably secondary foot issue yeah. that's in there as well. We had somebody come in and talk about the pelvic – well, she wasn't specifically talking about the pelvic floor, but a lot of individuals, especially within lifting, they urinate sometimes yep. because of – some say it's just the weight they're moving, but she was mentioning that it could be a weak pelvic floor. So specifically for the pelvic floor, since you do work with so many people on this, what are some things they can start doing at home to bring a level of awareness to their pelvic floor? Because some people don't know how to activate those muscles or they don't know what they're doing. Like when we were squeezing our booty holes, they probably <laughs> squeeze their butt at the same time, right? So how can they bring some awareness there? Yeah, so I have, um, I have videos on YouTube, but I typically teach people a clock and the Kegel Poogle. <laughs> <laughs> way to do it yeah. and the clock i i like the clock more some people find that hard to like shut their eyes and visualize this clock right um if you want to know the clock i can share with you the clock yeah what's the okay. what you mean? Yeah. so your your clock is i'm sorry i'm doing everything that i have to do. your clock is here okay okay so the clock is the base of your pelvis uh -huh. your pubic symphysis is 12 o'clock your tailbone is six o'clock. Your mm, right yeah. ASIS is three. Your left 
ASIS is nine. So you have 12, six, three, nine, right? Yeah. I'll t- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you, you got to close your eyes to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll typically yeah. teach people to do it on their back because it's easier to do something on the floor, on the back, but whatever, we'll do it standing. So we're here. You want to stack your rib cage in your pelvis because if you're standing with a flared rib cage or in an anterior tilt, the pelvic floor cannot contract as effectively. Mm -hmm. You would shut your eyes theoretically. I would want you to set your base, so spread your toes, find your tripod, and then you start to see the clock, and then you're going to draw 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and then you're going to release it, right? And then again, 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and then release it, and then we'll do it one more time, and we'll add on. So 12 to 6, hold it, and then draw 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Now, you know that's your TVA, right? Yeah. your TVA. Okay, right? And then release it, and then we'll add in the feet just because we're all about foot to core. So we'll do 6 to 12, hold. 3 to 9, hold. Now push your toes into the floor and then release it, right? So it's kind of yeah. weaving into a clock. Yeah. Um, I do tell people to engage their pelvic floor about 20%. So you don't want to be <laughs> maximally contracted mm-hmm. into your pelvic floor. You can irritate your pudendal nerve, which you do not want to irritate. It's the nerve that runs that nerve through your <laughs> perineum. Okay. So you do not have to show a video or a photo of that. Um, <laughs> You could have. No. I'm sure. Don't want to get demonetized. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So, but the pudendal nerve is, it's very important because a lot of people think, okay, hey, pelvic floor, stronger, harder, more, right? Like I need to, same thing with the foot. Yeah. Like I need to maximally contract the foot. I'm like, no, you don't. Say hello to the foot, relax the foot. Say hello to the foot, relax the foot. Say hello to the pelvic floor, <laughs> Something release. coming to your mind too. Uh, are you talking about the perineum? Perin- I can't think, say that. Nah, nah, no, no, nah, nah. my mind, okay. my mind. Yep, just... it was. <laughs> okay, <laughs> your mind. Oh, okay, boy. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, but yes, so that's the clock. The kegel poogle. Mm-hmm. We did the poogle. That was lifting your levator and I stopping your poo. Mm-hmm. Right, that whole one. Um, but I want people to feel the difference between the anterior pelvic floor, the posterior pelvic floor, because if I'm doing like a back squat, right? Mm-hmm. Then I'm sorry, I have to move again. I'm going to be like a video nightmare or an Eddie. <laughs> no, it's fine. Nightmare. But if I'm here and I'm doing a, a back squat, right? And some mm-hmm. people even will lift their toes. When they you okay. step a little bit. Um, there you go. Okay. Here, if they do that, that's okay. But we'll just keep them down for here. If I'm down here, right, and I'm about to like push up, mm-hmm. I want to be here, drive my toe. As soon as I did that, my levator, I and I just like drove up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm here. I got the weight, lifted my levator, A and I. I'm going to grip the bar harder. My toes are pushing down. And then I'm going to go shh, up like this. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'm just stacking through this fascia line, having that connection between really what feeds the stabilizers between your foundation center of mass. And that, I mean, I need my glute to engage. Right, mm-hmm. your posterior pelvic floor is actually blended into your glutes, so stronger glutes get through your pelvic floor, your posterior pelvic floor. Yeah, right. Um, so that's a way that the listeners can kind of play with the pelvic floor. Last thing I will add is your pelvic floor is an anti gravity muscle, which means that when you contract it, you have to feel it lift. It's not a fist; you're not squeezing yeah. the fist, right? You are lifting, right? And if I actually engage my pelvic floor just standing here, I feel less pressure on my feet. I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Uh, when I was younger, like when I was like 22, 23, I downloaded this Kegel app because because uh, <laughs> I was just like, so it that that got me tuned into the pelvic floor because I was like, am I doing this right? Then I YouTubed and a bunch of shit. I was like, oh, wow. Makes a difference. So. Just some fun But the, the the Kegel is very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Kegel is kind of like a fist. Mm-hmm. The other one for like the lady listeners would be like vagina weights. Yeah. What are those balls thing called? The, the, um, I just know the Kegel. Them Benoit weights. balls. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, wow, the, yeah. Yeah. The, those are the weights. <laughs> Do you? No, I don't know, but that's. I mean, it makes sense, yeah. <laughs> what are you taught? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know what Ben Wobble's are? I know, Sean, are. Yeah. 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 I got some in right now. Um, do you think that, uh, like, if we stayed connected to movement from the time we were young <clears throat> and we didn't potentially fuck ourselves up in the gym, mm. 
Do you think we would need to really practice hardly any of this stuff or would it just kind of be there? Like you mentioned, like engaging the glutes. It's like, I don't think there's much thought about engaging the glutes when you're sprinting or running a hill, especially if you, again, stay connected to movement from the time you're young. Yeah, I mean, that's where I think that injury mm -hmm. and certain compensation patterns, maybe inactivity, whatever it is, does lead to this disconnection or this lack of connection to the sensation of that muscle contracting. Or maybe you picked a weird sport and you've been on a bike cycling, you know, for the last 10 years and right. you're in a certain position. Yeah, right. or something, Habitual right? patterns, right? Yeah. That, that really fed into that. Um, yeah. So I, I do think, and I can always tell, and I know with lifting, so I'd be curious with you, is people who did maybe more like a body weight sport and then they start lifting weights heavy and then they're like, ah, like I just can't find that same fascial mm -hmm. movement. Yeah. And I can always tell, and I, I know a lot of the people on like Instagram that kind of demonstrate a lot of like certain levels of joint mobility, mm -hmm. they've probably always had a certain level of fascial flexibility within their body that they didn't unravel through like lifting weights or something that like a, that. <clears throat> that is a uh, conjecture I've had for a long time is that <clears throat> I've seen people make a lot of improvements in a lot of things, but mobility wise, people, I know they do make improvements, but it's probably just access they already had to something that they did when they were younger. Correct. It's Correct. like rare to see somebody like really just go from being somebody that was kind of quote unquote born stiff or turn stiff through their yep. environment, get themselves unstuck. Right, right. Um, there was um, this guy, Dan Edwards. <coughs> Do you know what parkour is? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, parkour um, is yes. gnarly. <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> so he's like one of the founder of Parkour Generations with the, which is a UK based parkour company. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to like teach similar conferences and things like that. And I remember he demonstrated this squat jump. And he was, he was literally crouched down here and jumped like, <laughs> like all the way across the room. And I was like, oh my God, like one, my knees would not like mm -hmm. tolerate that. And I, I was like, I have to ask you, like, is this how you always moved? Like, did you ever, ever have a stint where you did like, you know, bodybuilding or lifting mm -hmm. really heavy weights? And he was like, no, this is like always how I've moved. And even with myself, mm -hmm. what I found, and it's interesting that you say about kind of tapping back into your mobility, is I was a gymnast for 13 years. And then when I retired, <laughs> gymnasts retire, we don't quit. We retire from the sport. Then I got into traditional fitness and uh -huh. started doing some of like the figure modeling and lifting mm -hmm. really heavy and completely different style, right? Mm -hmm. Very hypertrophy based and things like that. I lost a lot of my prior flexibility and connection to my body. And then that's why I stopped doing that. And the last seven years, all I've been doing was more aerials. I got back into like body weight stuff. And I've been able to tap into different types of strength, totally leaned out in a completely different way. But I still feel like some of the stress that I did on my body during that like heavy lifting hypertrophy period, uh, put some damage on the body that I'm like, mm, I don't know if that will ever go away. So it's just kind of interesting that, I don't know if you experienced that on yourself as yeah, well. Yeah, I've experienced the same thing. I, don't, I just don't think it's respective of uh, what the human body does and the incorporation of all the internal, external rotation uh, that happens most of the time in sport and also the reflex and reaction that happens. Like you don't really get that in the gym. I'm sure you can like mm -hmm. make it up, but it's kind of a hard thing to figure out in a gym. Yeah. And that's why I got really into kettlebells because I feel like mm -hmm. that that you can train this level of strength that's obviously weighted. Yeah. But then there's this component of momentum, multi-directionality, depends on how you're, you're yeah, moving the, the bell. Yeah, dealing with the swinging a particular way and you got to figure out like it's probably best to swing with it than mm -hmm. to resist it, mm -hmm. right? Those kinds of things. Yeah, are. that and the still mace. Mm -hmm. Still maces, Steel maces are, are cool. Yeah. You know, what you're saying there, like, I'm curious specifically what kind of damage you think is still there because um, with lifting, I I feel as if people, because a lot of people want to put a lot of muscle on. Some guys want to put a lot of muscle on. Women also do too. Um, but it seems that you can do things with lifting and not have it damage your movement 
if you have something you do that's respective of movement outside the lifting or if it's incorporated into your lifting, like you're talking about kettlebells, or if you're actually also doing some body weight work mm -hmm. where everything can work together as you stack all this tissue on. Because there's this guy, um, I I'm, had Andrew find his Instagram. He's uh, His name's Andrew. We're actually going to be having him on the podcast. Oh. Uh, his Instagram handle's at the shirtless dude. Now, yesterday we went to this place, Asha Urban Baths, and he's 230 pounds, like six foot four. When he played soccer in, in high school, apparently he was like 160, 170 pounds. Okay. He was hypermobile, right? So he's doing wild shit. Like his shoulder, he can- <laughs> This shit's wild, dude. Like, <laughs> also at 230 pounds, he can literally, you know how ballerinas will walk on top of their toes? Mm -hmm. He can stack all his toes underneath him and just walk <laughs> normally like that. 230 pounds at six foot four because he's maintained this hypermobility while stacking muscle onto uh -huh. his body. And even myself, like my, my movement and mobility has improved over the years. I had to work on that, but even though I'm muscular, working on that hasn't like, it, it's only been beneficial. I would beneficial. still say that he's probably born with it though, right? No, no, okay. So he's an example of someone who was hypermobile. Right. But I wasn't hypermobile. I, I, I wasn't hypermobile when I played soccer. I had to work on my mobility. And by working on my mo mobility through the years, I've been able to become very, very mobile. So I think it's, yeah, he's he was but born were, with it and he maintained it. But were you stiff? Was I stiff? I was stiffer than most. Mm. I was stiffer than most. But that's like, if you see like when I started doing mobility shit, yeah. like I couldn't squat to depth. Mm. Before I read Kelly Sturette's Supple Leopard, mm. I couldn't squat to depth. And then I started working on mobility to be yeah. able to squat to depth. So That's it's like, those are things that like had to work on, mm -hmm. but it took years to right. build that level of mobility. I just brought him up because he's someone who was born with it. Yeah. And he stacked muscle on right, it. Right, and right. It's just the shit he does yeah, is yeah. wild. Like a Flex Wheeler or someone like that. Like he was born really mobile. And then even when he was jacked or Kai Green, right? We've seen was some of those guys. To still access Even it. Ronnie Coleman. Yeah, yeah. Ronnie Coleman was pretty mobile. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, really, that would be the best way is, right? If people are doing, you know, lifting traditional weights, maybe unilaner movements, things like that, do a little bit of more like sled pushing mm -hmm. or kettlebells or mace or something and then still add in the body weight, you know, maybe still yoga. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> something, but hit all planes Playing of- Playing sport. Yeah. yeah, play sport, run. Did he right? do it? I think he did it. This motherfucker- <laughs> wow, I was trying to get this and he did it. Yeah, he's super fucking mobile. Okay, now I have to get this this week. It's something that uh, this guy oh, we had, Olong Galani, came on the podcast and did it. He's a, a one championship fighter and looks like <laughs> just fucking did. Andrew did it too. Fuck! I'm so <laughs> angry. <laughs> oh, he did it back the other way. He did it back the other way! <laughs> this whore. Oh, man. <clears throat> No, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just joshing. I got a, such a cramp in my hip just watching. Yeah, right. <laughs> <Fuck>. My glutes. <laughs> <laughs> Look at his control, though. Like this guy. If you, hopefully, he'll come in, stay, so you can see. He's literally just a specimen. It's wild. I hate people like that. <laughs> <laughs> he would be a good aerialist. He probably would. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, like I do these aerial. My back is not talking flexible. about like silks. Like that's why I'm so jealous. Yeah, I do. I trained in silks initially, and mm -hmm. then now I do straps, which is, I don't know if you know straps. It's you're essentially locked into mm -hmm. it. It's mm -hmm. like two seat belts essentially coming down, and it's more wow. strength moves, yeah. but it's a lot of like shoulder back flexibility. You're hanging mm. all your body weight kind of like this. Ooh. I'm sure there's a way to pull up some like yeah. cool straps and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but yeah, my back is... Because again, from from lifting weights, mm -hmm. and even though I did gymnastics, my back was never really highly flexible as a gymnast. Yeah. But I was very strong, um, kind of in that like L sit position, like strong hollow, mm -hmm. great hollow this way. You get me doing anything, kind mm -hmm. of in that plane. Yeah. Gotcha. But yeah. So you have, to have, ask you, have you always been uh, kind of explosive? Like, because uh, some people that gravitate towards gymnastics sometimes they're when they're younger they find that they're or at least the reason why they stick with it is because they are pretty explosive and they're fairly strong for their uh their strength to weight ratio is really good yes yeah so i like anything explosive when i did competitive cycling i actually did track cycling so i did very oh, wow. specific yeah, yeah, yeah. type of cycling versus you know long mm -hmm. long long distances when i did track i did triple that jump probably made your and, quads go nuts and right? hurdle yeah <laughs> your quads probably blew up oh right? very yeah yeah so when people see me stand i'm still in a gymnast 
than a cyclist <laughs> posture. Mm-hmm. I am in like a, I'm ready to go yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like this. <laughs> but um, yeah, cool. so very, very strong anterior. So it makes sense why I got a sports hernia then, mm. right? Very, very anterior dominant. Yeah. Andrew, want to take us on out of here? Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Sincerely appreciate it. Uh, please drop some comments down below and make sure you guys like and subscribe before you guys head out. Uh, please follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Zima. Where are you at? Um, by the way, guys, as far as Nobelso stuff's concerned, I think we may have a code by okay. the time this episode comes out. So just if you want to go check any of that stuff out, the code will probably be the Power Project yeah, or just, just Power Project. Yeah, just check the uh, check the description and it'll give you all the info. There you go. Mm-hmm. At Nsima Inye on Instagram and YouTube, at Nsima Inye on TikTok and Twitter. Join the Discord, Discord to come talk about all this shit because there's a lot to talk about here. Um, Dr. Emily, where can people find you? Uh, Instagram is the functional foot doc. I am on YouTube as well. And then Naboso is Naboso underscore technology. And the website is naboso.com. Where did that name come from, by the way? It is a Czech word that means barefoot. Oh, I am wow. not Czech. Everyone is probably going to say that. <laughs> Are you Czech? <laughs> Some Czech people in the chat are like, that is not barefoot. I know. Yeah. I was I was in Prague when we came up with the name. Sick. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it and Thank love you. the products. Um, there's not a lot of products I use every day, but I use your products every day and appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.